Hey, welcome back. Dr. Brooks here with Chapter 23, Screencast 15, Over the Elbow. Uh, last week we covered the shoulder, so we are making our way down the upper extremity. Uh, basically, after today, all you have left is wrist and spine. So we're getting real close, so hang in there. I know it can seem like a lot, but make sure you're keeping up with the readings. Make sure you are keeping up with the, th the assignments, and uh, we'll finish this sucker out here pretty soon. So appreciate uh, the hard work that you've put in so far and I'm looking forward to seeing how everyone finishes out the course. So today's lesson uh, will in involve uh, uh, basically our, our standard procedure where we're going to go through uh, some anatomy review. We are going to look at assessment and then injury recognition and management. Uh, you may have heard before, it's impossible to lick your elbow. Well, this guy proves that that's not necessarily true, uh, if you can believe everything you see on the Internet. Um, so I'll wait while you try to lick your elbow right now, because I know once I said that, everybody tried. Just kidding. Um, so let's get started. The uh, elbow is critically important for our overhand throwing athletes. So we have the lateral collateral ligament complex. Uh, as well as the medial collateral ligament complex. We're going to take a look at each of those in turn. So we'll start with the LCL complex first. So lateral, away from midline. Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the radial collateral ligament because that's where the radius is. So you see on this diagram, it's labeled as the radial collateral ligament. Um, you will also see ulnar collateral on the medial side. One of the reasons a lot of sources have gone away from LCL and MCL is to eliminate any confusion with the knee. We've talked about LCL and MCL at the knee joint, so uh, probably calling them radial and ulnar collateral ligaments is uh, a little more contemporary. Okay, so our lateral or radial collateral ligament originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, that bony ridge, you can feel it on yourself. It then fans out and merges with what's called an annular ligament. Now that, that term annular, uh, if you've got annual flowers, they bloom every year. It means around. Okay, So our annular ligament encircles the head of the radius and it allows it to spin so that we can pronate and supinate at the distal radial ulnar joint. So the radial collateral bundle provides resistance against various forces. So just like we did in the knee, if we want to test this ligament, we're going to stabilize and we're going to push from medial out. And that will stress the lateral collateral ligament. Uh, this also serves to stabilize the annular ligament. Okay, So these ligaments aren't independent structures. If you ever get a chance to see a cadaver, uh, it's kind of hard to tell in a picture, but in an actual cadaver, even if you do something like a, a pig dissection or a, a cat dissection in anatomy, uh, you'll see that ligaments are not the brightly colored independent structures that they look like in a lot of diagrams. They are kind of all mishmashed and woven together, and it's kind of hard to tell where one structure stops and another one starts. So our radial collateral ligament, we see it here, we see the annular ligament, these fibers actually kind of merge together and it's kind of hard to tell where one stops and another one starts. Now the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, we see this kind of transverse band here, this is a thickening of the joint capsule. Uh, it originates on the lateral epicondyle and inserts into the ulna. Okay, so this is another lateral stabilizer. This also serves as kind of a gutter or a buttress that keeps that radial head from sliding uh, medial to lateral. Okay, so you can kind of see it here and how it prevents that radius from moving laterally in the, in the elbow joint, almost at ankle. Injury to that LUCL allows abnormal supination of the ulna on the humerus, and this can cause that radial head to subluxate posterior, so it moves backwards uh, on the capitulum. Uh, so the way I remember this is the capitulum is the lateral joint surface, the trochlea is the medial. I always remember kaplat, like the sound 
slime makes when it hits the pavement. Caplat. The capitulum is lateral. The trochlea, trochlea refers to uh, a spindle, and you can kind of see how it has almost like this this bobbin or spindle-like appearance. If you've ever, if you've sewn or if a family member of yours has has sewn with needle and thread, you can kind of see how that resembles a a, a, a bobbin that would be used to to spool uh, string on. So the trochlea is medial, the capitulum is lateral. Okay, so we also have an accessory LCL that basically serves to kind of fortify the annular ligament and it stabilizes that annular ring in times of various stress and that can be from anywhere from doing push-ups or other load-bearing activity. Uh, lots of times in the upper extremity we don't get a lot of varus valgus stress from uh, closed chain activities. We don't do a lot of weight bearing. So we'll see valgus forces in a throwing motion because of gravity, because we are basically putting force across the medial aspect of the joint as we throw. We don't have that uh, opportunity or possibility as often on the lateral side because that's not, we don't throw that way. Now, some exceptions to that might be backhand in tennis. Uh, if a, if a, an athlete is a switch hitter in baseball or softball, then then they might en encounter forces like that. But it is uh, it's not quite as common as valgus force. Okay, so we see this annular ligament, annular ring. Um, this is a uh, a structure that's designed to allow that radial head to spin, but it also binds it or tethers it. Now, if you notice the radial head kind of flares out. You can almost imagine like the, the bell on a trumpet. And the annular ligament is not just a square band. It, it basically forms kind of a funnel shape that cradles that bell and keeps it from gliding inferiorly. So that if we're holding a weight in our hand, it's not pulling that radius out away from the elbow joint. It's actually bound rather tightly from the annular ligament. So it does provide stability and resists those traction forces while also allowing that radius to pronate and supinate. Okay, as we said, this is not how it looks in a cadaver, but they're shaded this way to help us identify the components of the MCL. So now we're looking at the medial aspect of the elbow. So we've got an anterior band shown here in red, a posterior band in blue, and a transverse band in yellow. Okay, so this anterior band resists valgus forces. So in other words, if, if my arm is, is out, and let's say I'm, I'm holding something and someone hits me from the outside, that's going to be a valgus force. Okay, um, The anterior band resists valgus forces throughout the range. Wherever I am in elbow flexion, it provides resistance there. Uh, it originates on the medial epicondyle, that bony prominence proximal to the elbow joint, and it inserts on the coronoid process of the ulna. Okay, the posterior band uh, runs, as you might imagine, behind the anterior band, and it resists valgus forces during deep flexion. Okay, so uh, we can't test this ligament's stability by putting the athlete in full extension, and we'll kind of talk about that when we get to the eval portion here in just a minute. And then the transverse band uh, basically fortifies the joint capsule, and it becomes taut when the other bands are taut. So it runs and kind of completes the triangle. Uh, and as I said before, oftentimes these these fibers kind of intermesh with one another and it's hard to tell where one stops and the other one starts. Okay, So this medial collateral ligament complex is frequently injured in throwers, pitchers in particular. So this is a this is a real threat for a throwing athlete if they suffer a an ulnar collateral or a medial collateral ligament complex injury. Um, they may avulse, so in other words these structures 
are still intact but their attachment points actually kind of tear away and they take a little chunk of bone with them and what happens here is it tears away takes a little chunk of bone with it and the body essentially chases that bone fragment down uh, as long as it's relatively closely approximated and fills it in with bone well that's okay but the problem is is that ligament is no longer as taut as it once was so we end up with a joint that's less stable than it was before the injury okay so this is referred to as healing in an attenuated position in other words that ligament has recovered but it's no longer as as taut or as strong as it once was uh, if the uh, the joint dislocates it can result in a tear of that common medial flexor group so you can feel that on yourself if you take one hand and place it over your forearm and you curl up into wrist flexion you can feel that medial group kind of wad up on you you can feel that contraction and conversely if you extend you can feel that lateral group of extensors tighten up so if we have a problem over the medial aspect it's usually a, it's it's not just ligamentous but it can also involve that flexor group now, as we've said before, we have static stabilizers in the form of ligaments, and we have dynamic stabilizers in the form of muscle and tendon. So the elbow is dynamically stabilized by three muscles primarily. The triceps you've probably heard of, the ankinesis, and the brachialis may be not as common. But all of these muscles provide compression across the joint. And if we look at the joint shape, we see how we have a convex surface and a concave surface here and a concave surface we don't see it as well here and a convex surface here so the point being is that there is quite a lot of, of surface area that can add stability if we smash it together so kind of think about this like a Lego if you've got a Lego toy and you know you've got the knobs on top that would be your convex surface and you've got the bottom of the Lego that's gonna be your concave surface well if they're just kinda of laying on top of each other they're not stable but if we compress them together they interface with one another and they provide a lot of stability so compressing the elbow joint can very much add to the stability of the joint Okay. So that's how our triceps, our brachialis, and our ankinesis, they cross the joint, and when they contract, they provide an added compressive force. Okay. Now at the shoulder, we looked at our anatomy in our brachial plexus, as well as some of the uh, vascular structures. We know in particular, you've probably all banged your funny bone before, okay, that ulnar nerve uh, runs just posterior to that uh, medial epicondyle, uh, but it's not the only structure that, that we're concerned about. Okay, functionally, we know that the elbow complex allows for flexion and extension. That's easy to see. Pronation is going to be uh, turning the hand prone. If we say a patient's in the prone position, they're face down. So think palm down, prone, face down, prone. Supination, on the other hand, is how we would hold our hand if we are holding a bowl of soup. You can't hold a bowl of soup with the palm down, it'll spill, right? So uh, we have roughly 145 degrees of flexion as well as 90 degrees of supination and pronation. Uh, extension is going to be zero. Okay. Now there are going to be some limitations there. If you've got an athlete with a lot of muscle mass, they might lose a little bit of flexion just due to soft tissue approximation, but it's a misnomer to consider someone who's highly muscular to be muscle bound. We know that that, ter that term isn't really true. If an athlete is active, chances are they are mobile um, or they're at least doing some things that are going to improve their tissue quality. Whereas if they are immobile, if they are uh, hypoactive, they don't do a whole lot, they just sit on the couch, we don't even call them an athlete, we call them a patient. Um, they're probably going to lack mobility. So we don't get more stiff usually when we begin to exercise. We usually will improve. Okay. We know that the elbow demonstrates a carrying angle due to the way it projects from the distal humerus. Okay. So this carrying angle we can see from the standing position their arm doesn't always run just straight down from shoulder to wrist. There's a bit of an angulation there. Um, 
this is a little more prevalent in females than males but we also know that the elbow is a critical link in the kinetic chain of the upper extremity okay so a problem at the elbow is 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 going to compromise performance for sure alright so that brings us to assessment of the elbow so just like before we stick with our hops procedure so our history here we look for past history of injury what mechanism did they have if they can specifically recall the moment that they were injured when and where does it hurt what motions increase or decrease pain give me your pain descriptors sharp or dull constant or intermittent localized or diffuse aggravated by movement relieved by rest all those normal questions that we ask uh, we also look for swelling. The elbow is relatively angular, so even a small amount of swelling we can usually see, unlike the shoulder. And then any previous treatments that they might have had and whether or not those helped. Next we go to our observation. So as we said before, we look at that carrying angle. Uh, any deformities that we can see here or any obvious swelling. We also know that the elbow has what's referred to as an isosceles uh, triangle uh, arrangement. So we palpate the medial and lateral epicondyles as well as the olecranon process and the distance between our thumb and our index finger should be the same as the distance between our middle finger and our index finger. Uh, if their elbow goes beyond zero degrees this is referred to as cubitus recurvatum. Um, here we see a slight carrying angle that would be cubitus valgus. If it's varus it's going to be like we saw in the legs. Uh, it's like they're bow-legged in the arms instead though. Okay we systematically make our way through the bony and soft tissue. So the humerus we can feel the medial and lateral epicondyles very easily. The olecranon process or the tip of the elbow. Uh, the radial head, if we pronate and supinate and we palpate laterally, we should be able to feel that radial head. It's not a perfect circle, it's actually kind of cam shaped. So as it rotates, we can feel it under our fingertip. Uh, and then we palpate. Uh, just remember, radius is always going to be thumb side, ulna is always going to be fifth digit side. So we can palpate that entire ulna. Then we palpate the medial and lateral collaterals as well as the annular. So, you know, it's impossible to really palpate the radial head without palpating the annular ligament. So you're kind of doing that as you go. And then other soft tissue, biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis. So biceps brachii, we're going to feel its insertion into the radial tuberosity. Uh, brachioradialis, if we hook our arm under the table, we should see that brachioradialis kind of pop up at us. Um, some other structures we palpate, the pronator teres, triceps posteriorly, supinator, and then we already said our flexors and extensors group. Okay, for special tests, we don't do a lot at the elbow, but we do some. We do our circulatory and neurological tests first. So we check their distal pulse, we check their sensation and motor function. Uh, we can do a tenel sign, so we're going to tap on that ulnar nerve in the ulnar groove. And we're looking to see if they get any radiating pain out into the hand. Uh, if it's hypersensitive, just a light tap produces a lot of symptoms, then that would be considered a positive sign. Uh, we do a test for capsular injury. Uh, we put them in full extension and then flex them to 45 degrees. Uh, the wrist is fully flexed and extended and we're looking to see if they've got any pain. So this is a pain provocation test. You can see a, a picture of this in your textbook. Varus and valgus stress tests are just like we saw for the knee. We just do them at the elbow. So a valgus test here, stabilize medially, apply force laterally. So that L in lateral is a valgus force. We see that L, think lateral. Varus, we swap the hand position, we stabilize distally on the lateral side, we apply the force medially on or approximately on the medial side, and we try to open that joint on the outside with a varus force. Okay, so these are stability tests. We're going to do this in full extension. We're also going to unlock the elbow and do it at about 15 degrees of flexion, just like we did at the knee. Okay, a couple of pain provocation tests, medial and lateral epicondylitis. Uh, we're basically just going to do an eccentric muscle test here. So the elbows flex to 45, we're going to extend that wrist and we're going to try to pull them into flexion while they resist and we're going to see if that bothers them on the lateral side. We're going to do the same thing, pulling them into flexion 
or they're going to pull themselves into flexion. We're going to try to pull them into extension to see if they've got pain medially. Okay, so in the case of golfer's elbow, tennis elbow, then that might fire them up. Another test we can do is called the pinch grip test. They're going to pinch their finger and uh, first finger, their second digit and their thumb, so first and second digits. You're going to pinch together, and we're going to try to pull that apart. We can also uh, do a paper test, so they hold that, and we try to see if we can pull it out. Okay, same idea here, looking to see if they've got good grip strength. Functionally, we just have them move through the full range of motion, check them for elbow flexion, elbow extension, pronation, and supination, and we're just looking to see are they relatively normal from one side to the other. That leads us into injury. So um, the elbow is subject to injury, lots of motion. Uh, we don't have a lot of bony structure, and there's quite a lot of exposure of the soft tissue to damage. So a lot of activities do place stress on the joint. So uh, we do see a fair amount of elbow injuries in athletics. There's also a lot of bony congruence in the elbow. So a little bitty piece of articular cartilage in that joint can re result in of a catching or a locking. Um, we don't have as much bony congruence in some other uh, joints, so uh, they're relatively more accommodating. So the way I like to think about this is imagine your car door, right? And if, if you took a, a dime and stuck that in the door jam of your car, you'd probably still be able to close the door. Okay? There's not so much precision in that door that that dime would stop it from closing. Okay. Now, if you go to a bank vault where they've got one of those huge, you know, two-foot thick doors, and you stuck a dime in the jam, it's not going to close. Uh, there's too much precision. There's too much congruence there. So it, it takes a very small uh, contaminant or foreign body to really gum up the works in something that has a lot of congruence. Now take your door jam in your car and you stick something like a hammer or a screwdriver in there and it's not going to shut. Okay, So uh, eventually you'll reach a point where that foreign body is so big that it won't allow that that articulation to function like it should. But in the case of the elbow it's not very uh, accommodating to a foreign body. And that's not necessarily a good or bad thing. It just means that any small amount of foreign body is probably going to be felt by your patient. All right, so that leads us into injuries. So uh, first we'll start as, as we have past several lessons with contusions. This is a vulnerable area due to a lack of, of padding, not a lot of soft tissue over the area. Uh, this can be the result of a single direct blow or repetitive blows anywhere from you know a contact or collision sport athlete like a football player all the way to someone like a volleyball player who is laying out landing on the floor now one of the concerns with this that we'll talk about next is an olecranon bursitis so as long as there's not a tremendous amount of swelling here we can pretty much rule that one out but either way, we're going to treat this with protection, optimal loading, ice compression, elevation for at least 24 hours. If it's really, really tender, uh, this is where our x-ray vision would come in handy, but unfortunately we don't have it. So we have to figure out, is it just a contusion or is there the potential for a fracture there? Now, in some cases, that same mechanism would result in a massive amount of swelling, and this is referred to as an olecranon bursitis. This can be an acute injury. It can also be chronic, uh, but in the case of a direct blow, this would be considered acute olecranon bursitis. And what happens here is we get a, a, a traumatic event that compresses the bursa, and it responds by filling with fluid. Uh, these will oftentimes need to be aspirated if they're this big, where the physician will actually uh, draw the fluid out of the elbow and then wrap it with some sort of compressive wrap to keep it from filling back up. Um, if we can manage this without aspiration, then it's better because the risk of infection is going to go down, obviously. But if it's really big and swollen like this, then that's going to be the, the, uh, the best approach. In the case of muscle strains at the elbow, this could be the result of excessive resisted motion, uh, a foosh injury from an acute uh, impact, 
or repeated micro tears that can cause chronic injury. Uh, most often we'll see that, that biceps uh, rupture, if it's going to rupture, we saw that in the shoulder where it could rupture proximally, it can also rupture distally at the elbow. So they're going to have pain with active or resistive motion. Uh, usually passive motion doesn't bother them unless we stretch it a significant amount. Uh, we can provide uh, police on this one as well, follow this up with cold therapy, uh, and then eventually ultrasound and exercise. With severe strains that don't seem to resolve, then we probably need to rule out an avulsion fracture or some other type of skeletal injury. Ulnar collateral injuries we see from valgus force from repetitive trauma, especially in our throwers. Uh, this can also be uh, the result of nerve irritation, wrist flexor tendonitis. This is the reason we don't let young athletes throw uh, junk pitches because of the, the amount of wrist flexion that's involved there. They're usually going to report with pain along the medial elbow, tenderness over that entire uh, ulnar collateral ligament uh, span. Uh, in particular, they're going to have pain with valgus stress. Uh, we may or may not be able to appreciate any laxity there. Uh, X-ray may show some some skeletal changes, but more often than not, uh, these are just going to be soft tissue in nature. So uh, an MRI would be the definitive uh, way of diagnosing these. So this is a, a baseball player who's who's got the telltale uh, Tommy John surgery. So what they do with the Tommy John surgery is they'll actually harvest out the palmaris longus. So that not everyone has a palmaris longus and some people only have one on one side or the other. It's kind of a redundant tendon. So the way you find that is to take your thumb and your pinky finger and pull it together and you're looking to see if a prominent tendon pops out there. If you have it then that's your palmaris longus. So if the athlete has it that will be harvested out and then the, the uh, the radius and ulna will be drilled and they will basically, the surgeon will go in and use that palmaris longus tendon to reconstruct the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, for a throwing athlete, uh, full recovery can take upwards of a year or even two. Uh, they're going to return to activity 22 to 26 weeks post-op. Uh, this is a long road to recovery. Lateral epicondylitis, or tennis elbow, is a pretty common occurrence, especially for a patient who's got poor mechanics. So they'll end up with tenderness over the lateral elbow. Uh, it's worsened with activation of that muscle, so we already went over that, that test for epicondylitis. Just dull, achy pain, usually no real known mechanism of injury, but that pain worsens and, uh, and we start to notice weakness in the wrist and hand if they try to fight through it. Over time the elbow can also start to lose some flexion and we may even lose a little extension and we've got significant pain with wrist extension. You may have seen these before. Uh, we talked about these with the knee, a counter force strap that helps spread that force out over the tendon. Uh, these can be beneficial but they're just a crutch. They're not the actual solution to the athlete's problem. Uh, doing eccentric strengthening and trying to improve technique can be helpful. We'll see this a lot of times in players who are learning tennis for the first time and they'll get the rackets with the huge heads on them because they don't have to be as precise. Well that ends up being a really long lever arm so uh, we may want to look at mechanics, look at their wrist position while they're playing, making sure they're keeping that wrist in neutral as opposed to trying to, to uh, put a lot of flexion or extension on the ball depending on whether it's a forehand or a backhand. And the same holds true for medial epicondylitis. This is referred to as golfer's elbow because it's a repetitive flexion issue so they swing through instead of keeping their wrist neutral or we also get eccentric load maybe if they strike the ball fat and they, they get some turf as they as they swing uh, they're getting a lot of resistance and a long long lever arm that's pulling them back into extension even though they're trying to flex. So this can also be associated with ulnar neuropathy so that Tenel sign may be positive um, but just like lateral epicondylitis symptoms are the same it's just a question of where uh, which side medial or lateral that they feel it. These uh, counterforce braces can be helpful for medial epicondylitis as well. Uh, if in severe cases, they may need to be 
uh, immobilize for a few days. But the key to this one is to fix any mechanical issues that they have. There's a reason that they're having this. This is a a a, a poor mechanics issue, and unless they the athlete is instructed or they figure out for themselves how to correct those faulty mechanics, it's going to continue to crop back up. Another condition we've seen at the knee is OCD, osteochondritis desiccans. As we said, there's a lot of congruency in the elbow, so this is especially problematic, even more so than the knee, where we get a loose body. Um, in children under the age of 10, this is sometimes referred to as Panner's disease, um, where they actually get an osteochondrosis specifically to that capitulum and they've got an avascular necrosis there, so there's actually some bone death associated with this. They'll describe sudden pain, locking in the elbow, and over time that range can return. Um, this may need to be treated uh, conservatively. Usually we can shut them down for a few days and they'll recover. Um, if repeated locking occurs, then those loose bodies need to be cleaned out uh, via surgery. Another condition we see is referred to as little leaguer's elbow. Uh, this is in some ways similar to medial or lateral epicondylitis, but uh, the concern here is that this is not just tendinous in nature, that there's also a skeletal component to this. Um, we see this in skeletally immature athletes. They end up with a traction apophysitis. If you remember from the knee, we talked about decorvanes. I'm sorry, not decorvanes. We talked about uh, uh, Osgood Slaughter's disease. I'll get there. Um, and with Osgood Slaughter's disease, we get traction across a tendon and we get a little avulsion, and then the body uh, fills that space with bone tissue. So we end up with a similar condition, but instead of at the knee, this is at the elbow. Okay. Uh, so we could also end up with a non union stress fracture. Uh, so this is much more than just tendinous in nature. There, there is a skeletal component, and the the ulna is involved. Okay, so this is a slow progression, and this is the reason why most little leagues have implemented pretty strict pitch count rules to prevent this from happening. Uh, chances are, if you're taking this class back when you played little league. Uh, even though it wasn't that long ago, there weren't pitch count rules in, a pl in place or in effect. And uh, as a result, there was a risk of injury. Uh, the patient may complain of locking or catching sensation. Again, that congruence in the joint is the reason for that. And they may lose some pronation supination. Okay? Uh, the treatment for this is pretty simple. Just shut them down, and usually they will resolve on their own. Gentle stretching, stretching and strengthening can be helpful but nothing that exacerbates their condition. And then we're going to start them back to throwing once they're pain-free, make sure that their form is correct. Another condition we deal with is referred to as cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, with cubital tunnel syndrome, we end up with an irritation and a, uh, uh, a subsequent progression of symptoms associated with ulnar nerve uh, trauma. So this can be a traction injury from a valgus force, it could be a genetic issue where they've got irregularities in the tunnel, or that ulnar nerve could actually sublux uh, anterior to its normal position. Uh, oftentimes they will have numbness and tingling in their fourth and fifth fingers, uh, tenderness in that cubital tunnel, and, uh, and just symptoms like their hands falling asleep, pretty common. Uh, lots of patients I used to work with would get this. They were in a manufacturing facility and they would get carpal tunnel in the wrist and cubital tunnel at the elbow and they would kind of occur simultaneously. And when we get to the wrist, we'll talk about carpal tunnel, but instead of it just being glove-like or more all throughout the hand, we see this ulnar nerve distribution is just along the, the medial border, the fourth and fifth digits in particular. So surgery for this one, uh, they may do what's referred to as an ulnar nerve transposition. Uh, we said this is a traction injury. So if you imagine this nerve kind of hooked behind uh, this bony ridge of the medial epicondyle, that nerve is instead moved anterior to the medial epicondyle and then bundled and tethered in place. So that effectively takes the tension off of it. Think about this like a rubber band or a rope. And if we take it 
in front of this pulley or this this corner it has to go around then it takes the tension off uh, and this is the the surgical approach that we use for managing this condition elbow dislocations aren't terribly common but they do happen uh, once had this happen in a gymnast where she missed a release skill on the bar she landed kind of inverted both arms and dislocated both arms at the same time so this can result from a fall on an outstretched hand with the elbow extended uh, the dislocation can be posterior like we see here it can be anterior uh, with the ulna and radius anterior to the humerus and it also and it can also be lateral um, this is distinguishable from a fracture because normally those medial and lateral epicondyles are aligned with the shaft of the humerus um, so we've got good linear arrangement here in the case of a fracture it might be angle angulated a little bit okay so this hurts a lot as you might as you might imagine so a lot of swelling severe pain and disability they're going to be holding that in a kind of helpless position not wanting to move it at all uh, this may oftentimes also uh, fracture the head of the radius when this occurs so this is a load and go we don't we don't stay in play with this one because of the risk of neurovascular compromise um, this could potentially be limb threatening so dislocating the elbow could mean amputation if this isn't managed appropriately they're going to be reduced uh, sometimes even under anesthesia and then there'll be some follow-up x-rays that take place after that to make sure that everything's in position and reduced appropriately uh, probably going to be immobilized for at least three weeks they can start doing some hand gripping and and some other things to maintain muscular activity but definitely no loading uh, no aggressive range of motion until everything gets a chance to calm down and start healing. Elbow fractures, oftentimes these occur from either a direct blow where they fall on a flexed elbow or indirectly a fall on an outstretched hand where the force runs up the arm. Um, there may or may not be an actual visual deformity here, uh, but oftentimes there'll be swelling muscle spasm, a lot of pain associated with this one. We're going to uh, monitor their neurovascular status, so their distal pulse, sensation, motor function. Uh, in an unstable fracture, they're going to need surgery. In a stable fracture, they're usually just going to be splinted, and that may be six to eight weeks. Unlike the lower extremity, that may be a little bit slower because it's load-bearing. Usually with the upper extremity, we can get away with this a little bit faster. One unique condition in the upper extremity we have to be aware of is referred to as Volkmann's contracture, and this can result in a permanent loss of motor function and irreversible muscle damage. So if, uh, if we see evidence of this, they need to be managed right away so that we can, so that uh, the ER or the physicians there can restore normal circulation. So a Volkmann's contracture, we see this kind of involuntary muscle spasm producing this claw-like deformity. Um, we don't want anything occlusive on the patient up near the elbow, so elastic wraps or casts. And this is going to be referred right away so that that local blood flow can be restored. Pronator Terry syndrome is an entrapment of the median nerve that results in a loss of strength. Okay, so uh, it may become trapped due to swelling or muscular hypertrophy. They're going to present with numbness and tingling in the first four digits. So unlike uh, cubital tunnel where it was in the fourth and fifth digits, this one we feel in first, second, third, and, and a little bit of the fourth. Uh, they, they oftentimes will present with a motor deficit. They can't aggressively grip. Uh, and then also weakness with pronation. Uh, these symptoms will usually be worsened if they try to, to grip or resist pronation. Um, if conservative management, we try to calm them down, whatever they were doing that started it, we pull them out of that. If that doesn't help, they may need a decompression surgery that frees that median nerve up. That leads us to rehab. Just a couple of quick slides there. Uh, we're going to strengthen through low resistance, high rep exercises. Uh, need to be pain free. We want to not just function on elbow flexion, extension, pronation, supination, but also shoulder and gripping exercises. Um, 
isometrics can be used if we're in a mobilizer we can have them doing uh, contractions of the bicep or contraction of the triceps uh, we can use proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation and isokinetics early in rehab and then as they progress we're probably going to go to our progressive resistance exercises with tubing, weights, kettlebells, manual resistance, all kinds of things. So some examples here of some closed chain activities. We don't think of upper extremity as being closed chain dominant. Most of what we do our hands are free to move but if we're looking for stability then closed chain is the way to go. So modified push-ups or push-ups on a ball, slide board exercises top to bottom, side to side, circles, seated press-ups. These are all good examples of exercises that add stability because as we said that compression of the elbow joint enhances its uh, stability. Okay. We also want to do some proprioceptive training, some balance, so we could do any of these with their eyes closed and add a layer of proprioception into it. From there we've got to figure out ways to progress. So a functional progression enhances healing, helps performance, and ultimately gets them ready for activity. Um, we're going to move this in gradual steps, so warm up. Uh, into a gradual buildup of activity and then over time it's going to become increasingly more difficult. They can return to activity after they have successfully completed their rehab but the question becomes you know are they going to be at an increased risk of re-injury and if if this is our athlete then yeah I mean they they've got some mechanical issues to address. In the case of trauma or a collision contact sport then there may or may not be anything we can do about mechanisms like this. So that return should progress with the use of restrictions so that we can measure their activity progression. All right, well, that wraps up this week. Uh, tune in next week as we finish up the upper extremity and discuss the wrist. So until then, Dr. Brooks signing off. See ya.